David hopefully will be joining us. But we are here today to chat all about how to build, scale, and test stoppable creative library. But before we get into the meat and potatoes, I like to kick off what we have going on today. And what that means is first things to talk about. And we love putting these events on for the community, uh, for creative strategists and creative strategy, because we are the hub for creative strategy. And what does that mean? It ultimately means that creative has become the most important lever for success in all of paid advertising. But what we also know is, is that there are media buying teams and there are creative teams. They need to be like this, but naturally almost create some distance between the two. So where motion comes to play and creative strategy comes to play is we really look to bridge that gap between both sides of that brain. And the way that motion makes this come to life is that of course there's steps that will follow, but we more importantly, we make it easy to analyze, visualize, and then share these insights across the board, as I'm sure Kevin is gonna be getting into some more. So that's what we got planned for today. A couple of housekeeping pieces to note here. So first and foremost, questions if you have any, you'll notice that in the right-hand panel, there's a number of tabs with one of them being Q&A. Please, please, please put your questions into that Q&A tab and feel free to upvote with you. The second thing that I always like to call out recording wise, hey, recording is going to be made available. If you've got team members, send it across the board. We definitely want them to be involved. And then the last thing I'll note is a little bit of a motion plug here. It's just if anybody here is interested or knows of anybody who might be looking for new roles, we have a bunch that are actively available. I made my own version of an ad related to hiring that you can check out that I put into chat. But um, if you're interested, apply. We're excited to grow the team. We're excited to grow the team. Cool. So without further ado, wanted to get into how to build, scale, and test in an unstoppable creative library. And I've said that David's going to be joining us, but I want to talk about Kevin a little bit. So Kevin, he mentioned that this is his first time like doing a live event with everybody. But I will say that like I've known Kevin, I want to say probably more than a year now, surprisingly, yeah. right? Yeah, it's yeah, been, yeah, yeah, it's been a while. It's been fun. Uh, I like to think at least amongst my friends, we were kind of an early adopter of 100%. motion. And you just came at the perfect time as I was developing out a naming system that just really fit in nicely with the features you were rolling out. And Kevin uh, is someone that I really respect for a number of different reasons. When it comes to like the media buying chops, he has 12 years of experience in the game, but more importantly, he's just like a mad scientist when it happens to come to, to naming conventions. And he's consistently pumping out some great content on his LinkedIn. So if you aren't already, please jump into LinkedIn and give Kevin a follow. He's going to continue giving us all the greatest information in the world. So that's what we got going on. Okay. Awesome. So now what I wanted to do here is center our conversation around the creative strategy flywheel. For anyone who's actually been to one of our events before, we talk about the creative strategy flywheel quite a bit. And what this represents are a number of steps that you can follow to all possible. So where Kevin and hopefully David will join us are going to walk us through our step-by-step -step on how we can start to make this come to life in your worlds. So what is it's Kevin? I'd like to start it off honestly, nice and easy. So when we're talking search and building out our personas, is there any um, light that you can shed on like where you ultimately get started in this process with your clients? Yeah, absolutely. So this is where David and I will really work as a team. You know, he has more of that uh, creative background team at Mute 6 a while back and is doing so now at Attention. So he's doing all of like the qualitative analysis, um, kind of like the traditional. He's going to be working on segmenting all of the creative into his uh, the three creative pillars we look at, um, emotion, education, and authority. If it's videos, he'll tag themes, do all sorts of that qualitative analysis, um, and also do like social listening. On my end, I'm going to be doing like a creative execution type and making sure that as David is going through all of these qualitative results on his end, I'm making sure there are no shenanigans that may have prevented ads or creative from being able to shine. Um, things like preventing to share a post ID is huge. Um, make or break an ad at times, depending on the situation. So I provide that short, sort of context to make sure that the execution didn't really prevent anything from succeeding. 
So that makes a ton of sense. And I do want to unpack like the shenanigans bit a little more. So for everyone's context, Kevin is hands on keyboard running those ads lives in ad accounts. And we've talked a lot about and I think there's been a lot of chatter in our community of how the media buyer role is evolving. And it's like you need to be a creative strategist or die. But Kevin is somebody who demonstrates like day in day out that there is definitely side of things. So Kev, I'm interested in learning more about like the shenanigans piece and understanding what the um, the initial analysis looks like. So talk me through like when you enhance, what are you actually looking for to form the creative strategy in terms of audiences, understanding the algorithm and pieces along those lines? Yeah, for sure. So there, I mean, there are a lot of different things that you can look at that may have prevented an ad um, from succeeding. A lot of things that I've been calling out in audits for years is the testing process and how they actually will test new creative. Um, sometimes it's more like a what I call it, it's like a shot on goal test where they just rotate it into existing campaigns, which, you know, to be clear, is still a test, but a lot of times that kind of puts things in an unfair situation because you could competing against an ad with like I've seen this recently, like 30,000 likes, comments, and shares. Um, that's going to be really hard to beat with any new ad, no matter how good it is. So not having like a clean testing procedure to actually get uh, the like force spent to these uh, new variations in a way, because um, there's also that aspect that clients invest a lot in creative. So launching it and then maybe a week or two later being like, oh, it spent a hundred bucks. Like no one really wants to hear that for something that they've you got to take multiple shots on goal. Um, I also kind of like to call out the types of tests that you can run. So like they're the tests that get you more algorithm winners, where it's kind of gladiator free for all. You just put all of the ads in a ad set or campaign or like say a ECO ad set and may the best ad win. And that's important to know, but there's also the aspect of trying to be able to extract themes. And in order to extract themes when you're testing, you need to test uh, as many possible variants as once at once um, to reliably extract those themes um, and get statistical significance. So yeah, it's a lot of things QA in that testing process. And then as far as the thing is sharing IDs um, that allows the social proof to accrue across ad as you're moving it just into whatever audience or part of the funnel that uh, uh, want to test it. And if you have like a, if you have an ad that has a shared ID going against one that doesn't like, it's always going to, it's almost always going to win unless it's like an evergreen versus sale ad. For sure. And, yeah. and something I'm always so curious about is like, especially as everyone um, for knows or doesn't, I come from the agency world myself, running ads across a number of different accounts understanding what's happening there. So Kevin, I'm, I'm very curious about your perspective here as we talk a lot about like the algorithm backing you into the, into a corner in certain cases. So what I'm curious about is like when you are jumping, actually looking at the account, of course, there's a testing structure that you're going to be looking at, but ultimately you're going to want to understand like where meta is determining to put money. Right. Mm -hmm. So what I'm curious about is if you have for how you view like um, what's going on in the account and how the algorithm is dictating what you should do. Yep. So always a goal of you know, most any buyer, but particularly with us, like your, your goal is always going to be to get like the biggest possible broad audience to be working 18. I think we, uh, a lot of people need to be doing more, especially since the functionality returned is seeing where that 18 plus broad audience is actually going. Um, you have 18 plus male, female, but in reality, when you break it down, you see that 80% is actually going to like 45 plus women. So mm -hmm. a big theme, I think over the next year is how do you make the broad audience bigger? And then how do you use creative to influence the types of people you're reaching while still within that broad targeting? So many tests on this recently since that functionality returned and just been getting some crazy cool results, like seeing certain value props just absolutely crush with like 55 plus, um, but end up being dead last out of 10 by a considerable margin for like the 25 through 44 segment. And 
more valuable to the client is like they can come to us and have these overall concerns for the business being like, okay, we're doing a little older right now. We would love to get younger. This allows us to use Facebook kind of as a focus group in a way to identify creative themes, and value props like that gifting message that actually can impact how the algorithm reaches new people. And we've seen even it can come down to just changing the color of the product. Um, that kind of indicates the product material. I saw one recently in a jewelry company where. Um, same ads, only difference between the ads was the material um, and color of the product in it. There's like silver and gold. Gold skewed old. Plus, silver actually gave most demos outside of like 18 through 24 a fair shot. And that's awesome because then we can launch it within our already running and doing the majority of the heavy lifting and actually mm. make it big. Got you. Okay. So there's a lot to unpack there, honestly, because I feel like even starting at the beginning of that, something that I'm quite curious about is talking about, okay, we had this idea of who the persona is, but instead it's delivering to something completely else. Uh, mm -hmm. Right. So in that instance, what I'm trying to figure out, is there like a methodology and like next steps that come, let's say you identify, you identify like an underserved audience mm -hmm. in this case. So after, like, how do you get to that point of, of, of what's working or served? And then after you've identified those two things, what are you doing next on top of that? Yeah. So this is where we'll, I'll be thinking with David um, more and relaying like, okay, these are the opportunities for iteration. So continuing and expanding on that um, where it skews older. So like, that's still important really out like honestly valuable because older audiences have more disposable income um but at the same time the data is showing if we exclusively into that messaging we're probably going to plateau the account we're going to expand or reach the younger demos that they need so without taking away from the winning messaging what can we introduce that allows facebook to reach new customers and that's the innovation aspect of like relaying the results of our tests. So always trying so, to iterate and innovate. Obviously one's easier than the other, but that's kind of the purpose of testing. Like not every test is going to be a winner. And honestly, when it comes to creative, most are going to fail, um, except the exceptional few, but you still have the valuable opportunity to extract themes from your losers and honestly not even really make investment. I like that you just sum it up there in the iterate versus innovate, right? Because like iteration is is really saying what's worked and let's continue to nail on the head and try to get it right while still getting the innovation of big swings in there. So we don't back ourselves into account. Something else that you and I separately talked about is the concept of like, it's hard, right? A lot of people touch ad accounts. Ideally, it's one person forever, but it rarely works that way. So what I'm curious about is in a world where you're looking at accounts where so many cooks have been in the kitchen there, we've talked about the concepts of closers versus clickbait in your analysis and mm -hmm. also pulling from different places. Can you walk the audience through like what the heck a closer and clickbait is, unpack it a little more of how you get there, all that good stuff? Yeah, absolutely. So I've been testing like 50 to 100 different ads, um, but it's all gonna be like a single variable. So say we're going to be testing different value props, which um, I often post about on LinkedIn and share those results. Um, we're essentially not just generating like a single winner. I kind of think of it more as like making a playoff field of contenders. And then we graduate them all and may the best one win. So one of those is going to obviously just be what most people look at, kind of be the hook or say the, that's good to know. Um, also look at conversion rate that it could be a really strong closer. Say if it doesn't have the best of click through rates or hook rates, then, but it has that really strong conversion rate, that's still super valuable to know. That could be something that you incorporate early into scripts. It might be that overlay that you lead with videos, 
or it's something that you can focus on in email as that second point of contact or start incorporating onto the landing page more. And then the clickbait is also still valuable. You, like you have something there, it might just be that you need to tweak and set expectations more, or it might just me, me, uh, need a, like a dedicated landing page. Um, so there's a lot you can do with that. And even more recently, um, I actually did not put this in that preparation doc. Evan, I apologize, but we started introducing an omnichannel lift rate metric for our tests. Um, it takes a little bit longer to get. Sometimes we have to extend our tests for a week, but essentially what it allows us to do impact of creative on traffic coming from other channels. So someone can see or view a Facebook, Instagram ad, and depending on what attribution window you're using, say seven day click or one day, to the website via another channel, uh, we can track that via custom conversions. And when we pull it into Ads Manager, it means it's happening after that clicker view. So we use that and we collect it over the course of the test. And then we can start seeing some extreme differences between the types of messages that actually drive people to, say, like search on Google. So more recently, in a test that we launched, the winning message was versatile. Um, specifically with that omni-channel lift rate, um, and it had a, it was five times more likely um, to drive people um, to go, uh, do some brand um, than the losing one, which was premium. So this is a more recent test. Um, when you set up the events, they don't back populate, so you kind of have to, you know, right. wait a little bit. Um, but it's been really exciting um, conversation starters for sure, and it allows identify a new winner because that one that's a lift it's not always the one that's a click a hook or a closer or a clickbait jeez first of all this is why i call kevin the mad scientist you can see how happy he gets and like the passion oh, yeah. starts to stream through which gets me fired up about yeah it. you get me talking right. about this especially with coffee yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but something I'm curious about, Kevin, is like, how do you set that up? Like, you came to a place where you're like, I know I want to start to see lifts across the entire gambit here. How did you go about thinking of how you can set that up? So this was a, you know, long process of trying to identify a cost effective way to test that was that would reliably get the same winners as a kind of more traditional test optimized towards purchases because to extract theme do that like i said we need that ad volume in order to make right. it reliable and if you're going right. to test say 50 100 ads under the purchase objective you know, the learning phase um if you want to get through the learning phase that's going to be an extraordinary so for years, I was launching, I was launching two tests kind of side by side. One would be some sort of purchase conversion test. How depends on the amount of creative. Like if it's 30, I uh, may do like DCO. I'll do just to launch them in an advantage plus. Um, if it's like five or less, potentially do an AB split test. And then also on the side, I wanted to start experimenting with what other events can I use and how can I tweak that process to get the exact same results or at least like the same top three as that purchase test. Um, and, in mind, and I hope people don't leave say this, traffic campaigns are very helpful and useful in this situation. Um, I'm kind of looking at you know, a conversation on LinkedIn and think I'm pretty... Sure, I'm in the minority in regards to loving traffic campaigns. Um, I, you know, I I don't like them for the common argument of filling the, funnel. you know, that you know, hundred percent aligned. You you do not want to use them for filling the funnel, but with a few special tweaks to the process, and if you introduce friction to the funnel and um, more events in your conversion rate formula, you can actually get very direct results as to what happens in the conversion campaign. Um, honestly, like 90% of the time, it'll identify like the top three ads. That order might change a little. Like I said earlier, I'm generating a playoff field here, not just like a single winner. So that mm. same three is still going to be valuable to me. But the benefits of the traffic test is we get those a lot faster, sometimes a week, maybe a two, two tops, 
three is the absolute max if we want to do that omni-channel event, um, event um, aspect of that. But yeah, it's it's been it's been really fun. Uh, just introduce like introducing all these new like testing procedures, um, and then we'll get the same results um, at a fraction of the cost, and also like a lot faster. I love the hot takes first of all, but honestly, like mer merging it together with the custom conversion starts to make a ton of sense to give you what you need from a lift perspective. One thing that I did want to do is, is, I know we have a bunch of creative folks with us here today. David was going to be our creative rock star, but it's okay. So I did want to tie to you all. So basically, Kevin, let me know if I've got this right and, and jump mm -hmm. in where it makes sense. But we've talked about like Facebook setup itself and understanding the algorithm and creative wondering okay why does that matter to anything that i'm doing i just need to follow this flywheel that evan has here of research ideation so on and so forth mm -hmm. and i'll pump out but why based on some of the stuff kevin has talked about this ultimately goes hand in hand with algorithm and flywheel is that we might start to see that the algorithm is favoring what kevin talks about is like iteration on these so it's starting to favor a certain demographic age group with specific creatives and value props you can try the biggest swings in the world, but you know value props are home for this ad account. So what that means on your end as a creative team member is you'll want to understand like what those home versions mm -hmm. of creative are. So you can start there in your approach to make sure you're getting instant winners. That's the way that this starts to come to life. Kevin, if I hit it on the head just for the creative Yeah, for team, sure. Like the, yeah. the iteration moments happen more. Um, and those are the moments where you can get those incremental that incremental lift but when you successfully find something that actually provides those innovation moments those are the like increased scale like 50 to 100 percent and the innovation stuff is where the creative people in here can have fun like you have that freedom to say hey i did the research to determine who my personas are these are the value props i want to go after them with let me have fun with it now what's yeah. a crazy hook i can put together yeah like, I, I, when experience. i first met david i tried his best friend. Um, I know sometimes buyers and creatives aren't always on the same page, um, just because we're looking at two different things. Um, sometimes it's just simply like a left brain, right brain um, type relationship. But I really just want to use this, use Facebook as a focus group for the brand, but to weaponize the creative team with as much information as possible. So I'll have this value prop test and I'll send to them like, hey, these are your best options for the hooks. You know, these are the things you can really reliably talk about early in a script, but you know, the value prop, that's not the extent of it. Like that's just an example. So we'll do the same process, say for like tone of voice, identifying buzzwords, um, you know, now that we have a reliable way of testing that only takes about a week per test, we can kind of pump these out and really give direction to the creative team because videos are you know, they're bigger investments, they take more time. And you just want to get more winners. If we can provide the information that reduces the amount of like, chances that you miss with creative, you know, that's going to be huge. And being a creative team members, basically articulate like both teams being like this, so the accounts can scale, ultimately. Okay, I did want to get back in like the, the ways that you like to test. I feel like we didn't do them justice. You gave it a little bit of context, but I want to give it some more essentially. Yeah. So something yeah. that I'm curious about is like, how do you go about testing different styles to identify? Um, I think you called them like different types of winners that you're mm -hmm. looking at. So yeah, um, specifically like the hook, you know, that's going to be like general great performer, good click through rate, good conversion rate. If you want to, sometimes for fun, I throw in engagement rate as well, just to nice. you know see if it's like a winner anywhere else. And then the closer is going to be something that has a average or poor click through rate, but it's one of the leaders of the pack in regard. So not only will I hand that to the creative team, but I'm handing that to the email team as well. And I'll, as always, anything's going to go back to the client because this is something they use outside of Facebook. Like they, this is something they can consider when updating landing pages. If we're using Facebook to test different image styles, then it could be, becomes a guide for like future photo shoots of giving them things to focus on. So in a way, like 
it saves money in more ways than just like having a more efficient testing process. And then finally, uh, so yeah, the click, I mean, clickbait, everyone pretty, everyone knows that, but refresh, um, high click through rate, really low conversion rate. And then the omni-channel lift rate. Um, so we have custom conversion it's the website and came from Google or Bing or the email provider, SMS or TikTok. And we can aggregate those divide by impressions. And if you want, um, kind of turn it into a CPM like metric and multiply by a thousand. So yeah, that's kind of my playoff field in like the average test. So um, then we will have the themes that we and turn into a report. And then on my end or the buyer's end, we have our winners too, that we can also just use in the account. But the whole point is to more value Facebook has beyond just raw performance. Because every mm -hmm. single agency in the world is going to be promising good performance. Um, and I'll, you know, be talking about testing, but how they actually test kind of shows deep they get um, with that process. Because if you don't have volume, like I'm like the, the themes you extract are not going to be reliable. Most definitely. Something I'm curious about now, Kev, is like, so being able to, to leverage data from the past to inform what ha happens in the future and even beyond just like paid social, Facebook being a focus group is such a good way to put it. Something that I'm curious about is when we're looking at this briefing stage, because ultimately there's going to be an asset that's produced and before that happens, everyone's aligned typically. What should, in your opinion, be a media buyer's contribution to what the brief includes? So yeah, the, the good question. I mean, it, you know, with us, you know, it's going to be a lot of those uh, test results in history because, you know, we're mm -hmm. doing this across consistently. We can aggregate um, if we want to say across a particular industry. So we can have that typical best guess going into it. It was uh, like official, uh, made those tests and relayed official recommendations to the team. Um, gotcha. And then, you know, the other acts, now this would have been kind of more for, you know, David too, just general things that the algorithm likes and making sure that we're always aiming for diversity with pretty much everything creative. Like you want as many ad formats working as possible, as many value props working as possible, just as many anything working as possible. Cause you know, as you know, Facebook ebbs and flows, you know, things are eventually gonna slow down. So you have working more formats you'll have things pick up the slack and reduce those moments of volatility where you're just hammering out it's been able to replace like what was providing the volume like two or three months ago. And in this instance, you would reference like, hey, this is probably something David handles more. So just to, just to hone in on the roles and typically who's yeah. responsible for well, that. I don't right? want to speak for him. I'm like, this is probably one of those <laughs> moments where he would have like corrected some <laughs> I'm using or something <laughs> like that. Um, but I really think the media should be involved in the process, but uh, like the biggest part for us is just making sure that execution is going to be super clean with this creative sure. and it's being set up for success. And if it's a particularly heavy investment on the client side, like we're going to guarantee that it gets spent. Like, you know, I've, right. I've definitely, uh, I, I learned this the hard way. Um, and going to like a weekly call a few times, having this big, uh, exciting video only get like a hundred dollars spent. Um, and there just wasn't anything to talk about. So the whole, th like the whole idea, the whole point is to just, so you can test as many elements as possible and just extract those themes and send it to everybody. Clients can use it the most exciting ones uh, have actually like totally pivoted their um, messaging in a way. Mm -hmm. 
an added benefit to this low budget traffic system is it's low risk and like I said, low budget. So occasionally you can get a yes to more things uh, that they wouldn't have said yes to otherwise. More instances of um, drawing outside the brand lines and identify new things that they hadn't considered before or they just assumed wasn't for them. So a prominent example for us, uh, it's kind of like a luxury accessories um, brand where we ran a value prop test and they bought in, we included the core value props and also the value props that they didn't think that they were. Um, and it turns mm -hmm. out their core value prop that they had originally built the brand and website around um, durability finished um, third to last. <laughs> and pretty much measured it, like was not good in regard regarding click through rate, conversion rate, um, everything. And one that they had not really considered, they didn't really set up their photo like photography for um was organization so that was pretty that really made them stop and think and i mean like for a few weeks um and came back to us and started at, like pivoting the whole brand in a way like creative on organization the landing pages featured more photos that showed that organ those organizational features and then the durability was kind of pushed a little bit further down the page because there's still people interested in it, but you know, less than the people who are interested in organization. That's so interesting. Cause something I've also like selfishly been curious about is, is Facebook being the place where you're able to, to, to access a large amount number of people, like you describe it, it's just being like a more or less. Um, Facebook might tell you one thing, like, I'm probably not giving a great example that'll lead into a question, but let's say you have a couple personas, one that's like uh, Daisy Dukes and then Sleepy Sally, whatever it might be, right? Daisy Dukes, we thought would be the best, but we see Sleepy Sally doing really well, on, for example. But then is Daisy Dukes, like, should we restructure everything around that? Or is it on like a TikTok? Or is it somebody we should go after on an email? Or how do you how do you uh, like navigate those type of insights? So similar to uh, what we did with like that value prop breakdown earlier, I'm uh, going to verify that there isn't a particular gender or demo that's throwing off these results when you're looking at them at the aggregated level. So in that earlier example, just looking at gifting at the aggregated level, it would have been a clear and decisive winner. But when you actually separate it out, you see, well, okay, it's only actually a clear and decisive winner with 55 plus and that's where the algorithm want to, went, wanted to go. Um, you know, the true winner is going to be the one that actually activates as many of those demos as possible. Um, and that's the one I'm most interested in. So if, mm -hmm. as long as, you know, there are no shenanigans, then yeah, I'll follow up and say, Hey, this might be something that's more appropriate for a channel or a different channel. Um, but I, I try and be as agnostic as possible with Facebook. Like it. in the end, it doesn't matter what our opinion is. It's the algorithms. So mm -hmm. I'll test something that no one likes. I don't care. Um, just in case, you never know. Ugly ads do really well. And sometimes you can just keep getting uglier and it still does really well. Um, and then just adds to that diversity too. Cause if you have like ugly ads and then with your videos, like I understand from the branding perspective that concerns people, but from the algorithmic perspective that increases your reach so much. Um, cause Facebook knows the type of content that people historically interact with and is more inclined to serve that to them, which is why having so many, um, is often a key element to scale. Like I said, it's, you know, easier said than done. You have to test into it. If you follow the Pareto, Pareto principle, you can assume that 80% of creatives probably going to fail. Um, yeah. but at least you can learn from it. Yeah. 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 And I think you like.
for the beginner's mind to it because it's just like, I don't know anything. I don't think like, who knows if this works, but throw it in and we'll see what happens at yeah. the end of the day. Right. Like it's, if we're well, testing responsibly, making sure it doesn't disrupt momentum and core campaign, or it's not getting like a crazy amount of um, budget. So the opportunity cost of this test is super high. Yeah, go for it. Um, this also, I think, is a way to beneficially lead the team because I really don't sh shoot down ideas. Um, nice. You know, it's a way of also keeping myself in check because I think you know it's easy for buyers, no, mat no matter what seniority level, to fall into patterns or to like become stubborn about something. You know, even you know, I, I I fall victim to that. So just freedom to test what they want when they want with approval from the client obviously as long as we test responsibly you know they know i'm not going to like come down on them because i just disagree with it um but those moments actually they do check me i've seen a manual carousel do well recently i had totally absolutely written those off for like a year um <laughs> so yeah those type of moments are love it uh, everybody, I have one last question for Kevin on my end. Um, I need to ask it, but just as a quick reminder, please keep upvoting and getting your questions into the Q and A tab. Going to be jumping there right after this one. Mm -hmm. And one last thing, I saw that Talia had mentioned in the chat. Like, are we supposed to be seeing that same slide? But yes, uh, we did have some stuff to share, but again, running into some technical difficulties, so we're making the best as we can just on this one. But Kev. Last question that I have for you. I would be ashamed if I did not ask because whenever anyone talks about naming conventions, I say I have a guy and that's where I start to point to. So for context, everybody, uh, Kevin is like a whiz when it comes to naming conventions. So something I'm curious about now is like, we've worked on all of this great creative that's now produced. And like you mentioned, you have a specific way you test into the account. What I'm curious about is like, how do you set up naming conventions and how does that then correlate right into your analysis after those are live? Yeah, for sure. So before we met um, and figured out, and I learned about motion, um, you know, my background in like statistics and data engineering. So I was thinking of and concepting out a naming system that would be very spreadsheet and formula friendly. Cause I want to be able to a database as fast as possible and reliably as possible, minimize the QA. If there are any like data scientists in the chat, like they'll know about 90% of the time you spent um, doing data science is actually getting and having a, you know, expansive and reliable naming system just saves so much time. And then also allows us to provide like insane depth to our reports and have them be like real time in motion. So you say we didn't have anything to share, but I can share my screen. Hey, um, let's you know, do it. I can walk through what uh, David prepared. Well, give, me, give me a minute here. So here. Um, and you might have to, Kev, you might have to zoom in for folks just so we can see it a little bit. Oh, yeah. Couple more. Give me a couple more if you can. More. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 175. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Cool. I like it. So with a detailed naming system, it's filled with qualitative information that we can't like just simply pull into a column and export. And that allows us to build these real-time reports that clients can have access to and get a sense of, you know, you know, some of the more basic things like, you know, what Ad formats are working, you know, here I opened up a few tabs because uh, so we, no one had to wait for motion to load where are things going in the funnel. Um, I did, uh, I can't um, share act creative and give away the client. Um, this is a pseudonym, but pretty much across all of our mission, we will have these four categories no reports that the client can always access and go into that will be always updating, looking at prospecting audiences, retargeting audiences, but on the creative side, by um, value prop. So part of our naming system is gonna have that value prop tag. And we use the uh, Facebook naming template to make it as easy and fast as possible, even though 
you know, looks very, very complicated and long. And, you know, sometimes with buyers a little overwhelming the first week, but once they get used to using the naming template and this gets pretty fast and doesn't really add that much more time, but it saves an insane amount of time when reporting. So we essentially don't have to spend that much time making creative reports anymore. As long as we're on top of our, all of these are automatically going to update. Um, and we just kind of have to go in and, and QA, make sure we didn't, there isn't like a missed character somewhere, something off, but either way that, you know, if you can save like 95% of your reporting time, you know, that can open up a whole day. Like I've talked to plenty of buyers who lose days to reporting. Um, so this just and the opens biggest thing the there is just like losing time, losing time. It's not like you just get it back and do nothing. It's like, instead of just manual, like grunt work and put, putting together reports, you can now shift to decision-making at the end mm -hmm. of the day. It's yeah, like, okay, can... now I can spend time interpreting the data to know what to do next instead of just yeah. putting the data together ultimately. You know, you, you have a chance to sit and kind of think critically. Um, and really just, it's a, it gives the brands and clients a lot to think about as well. These are, these are not test campaigns right here. Like every single ad is tagged with a value prop tag. So these are like core campaigns, gladiator style. I'm not controlling the spend anymore. What value props are driving the performance? Um, and then also just kind of when we do have our controlled theme, they're down here. And like the sales and promotions, we can break things out, you know, for Pierce and Pierce find detergents, bonus points if you know what that's from, um, and break out the creative for each specific set. Uh, image style breakdown, in addition to value props, like we segment all of our creative by style. So this is for images, so it can be model UGC. Product stylized, that's typically how you know, we define any sort of products shot that's been set up in a special studio e-com shot. Um, and then we separately will tag those uh, general product e-com shots because nice. sometimes they do surprisingly well. Um, like I said, you know, just because something's ugly, you, know, you should test it. Um, then just general graphics. So this is something that David also has access to and will be a strategy. So in a way, this is where the, kind of circling back to an earlier question, where the media buyers come in to like create but it's not necessarily like based on this. It could also just be us being on top of naming systems. So the creative team flexibility to go in here whenever they want and um, come away with learnings. Love it. Uh, one thing I, I have a follow up on is just mm -hmm. like all of these reports stem from the naming. Is there any like examples or something you can share that showcases to our audience specific things that you're tracking, if it is consistent? The consistent part um, is going to be, I mean, be here. So we have a style tag that's going to be going through all, all the image styles. And then we also have a video theme tag going through all the different video styles. Um, David actually is in the process of combining those two tags into one. Nice. So we'll be having an update here soon. And with that, we're going to add a few more tags. So um, one of those is going to be the creative pillar, which is how the entire team is going to be thinking about and approaching their career. As a reminder, we're going to be education, emotion, and authority. So soon we would have that ongoing breakdown here as well value props, and then honestly, have some custom tags for each client. So one of the things we like to do when onboarding is like, what questions can we answer for you? And then try and come up with a strategy to use Facebook as that focus group to actually give them the data that can help them make big expensive decisions. So sometimes that will require like a custom tag. Um, so on brands that do like say a lot of whitelisting, or influencers, I'll add like a page tag. So I can label, you know, what actual page is this coming? From. But that's not something I need on most accounts if, you know, say 90% of the ads are just coming from the, uh, the brand page. Love it. And if anyone 
plug. You can see Kevin here using Motion. Feel free to check us out. Uh, book some time so you can talk about how to make this come to life for you all. Cool. Uh, it, it, it's cr it's crazy just um, because I mean, like you just get so much depth with these reports, and they don't take that much time as long as you're on top of it. it has that uh, that depth to it. Love it. Okay. Um, and yeah, with that let's, time, let's... you know, we've had buyers take on more accounts, which uh, positively impacts their income. Hand in hand, business and goal, business, yeah. everyone's goals being met. To here with our last 10 minutes is just like a bunch of questions that have started to pile up. So let's do our best to try and get through them. Um, but I think like where I'll kick off is the one that has the most votes, 15, hopefully it's a nice and easy mm -hmm. lob is one here. Can you define share IDs? And I think you had mentioned this like pretty immediately that we had Yeah, about. so I, I think it's super, super important. And I think it honestly, in a lot of cases, it is even more important than structure. Um, so when we say, um, I guess, you know, stepping back, when you, when you launch an ad, um, you're going to be creating two IDs in the account. There, there's going to be the ad which is going to be created every time you create an ad, but also there's going to be an unpublished post made that's actually used to show the ad. And that's, what it is. And, or the, or the post ID uh, you can, those can be used interchangeably and you can actually share that content ID. And the content ID is where all of the social proof is stored, not the ad ID. Mm. So that way you can have, you know, multiple, ads that are all actually using the same ID. So if you're running them in like 10 different audiences, all of the engagement's going to stack. So that's how you see those posts in Facebook. That massive amount of social proof. Like I guarantee you, except in the most extreme situations, those are shared post IDs. <laughs> Awesome. Everybody, I hope that one helps. If it doesn't, just throw it into the chat really quick so we can clarify. But I wanted to jump to the second most voted question, and it comes from Justin here. Mm -hmm. So quick question regarding uh, StatSig. Our agency agrees that 1K spend minimum for the first ad set run with typically four to six ads. Does that match a benchmark that you might use? Does relevance? So 1K in spend, does that fit StatSig for you? So I actually do one ad per ad set. Um, yeah, I know it looks like I actually do I mean, I, I, I do test this way. I'm not in any way saying it's wrong. Cause you know, the most important thing is you find a way to test and you know, how you do it is going to vary by account, by situation, by budget. Um, but if I want to make sure that every single variant gets the same amount of spend or else spend's going to be a technically a variable. And if you're calling it a single variable test and you're just trying to test creative, but then spend is also a variable, it's no longer going to be reliable. Yeah. Um, and on tests, you know, one K is actually, you know, one K for a week, you know, that's probably going to do it. Um, sometimes we can even get the, get it the same results at like $500, but just let it run for the full week just to be sure on the purchase side, man, that varies. Um, so 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 much uh one account right now that's like a 800 hundred dollar aov to test that to to test with like the purchase objective there actually want to get through the learning phase that would be a considerable investment cool so we have some questions now about the testing i think this goes hand in hand with what you're uh with what you're talking about here but Andreas asks, yes. hopefully I've pronounced correctly, what methodology do you prefer to test new creative framework? Same group. One ad per ad set. Maybe it's like yeah. what budget optimization yeah. are you yeah. typically both. running there? Yeah, in the <laughs> ideal situation, both. Um, you know, sometimes and performance may not allow both, but that's why I like having the graphic test because I know by doing this for a while, it's reliable and it's not going to be like an, a huge opportunity cost, you know, regardless of like the overall budget of the account, unless it's like a couple hundred dollars. Um, 
And then on the side, I do like to identify that algorithm winner, that gladiator mm. style free for all. That can be a dynamic DCO test, um, depending on the amount of creative. More recently, I've honestly just been, say if I have like 30 variants, just launch them in an Advantage Plus campaign. Um, but I still want that traffic campaign on the side. So I have the flexibility to turn off that purchase campaign find that the opportunity cost is insane and not really um, great for performance. So people are definitely curious about the traffic campaign because Justin comes with another question. I was just so, like, so. <laughs> yeah, this is where David would have been really I had to convert him essentially once he started. Um, <laughs> so before he started, I was comfortable running the traffic tests um, just by themselves for like a year. Um, I knew he would have some questions um, and he was a little skeptical. So I started running them side by side again and on accounts that, you know, was, didn't negatively impact performance and showed him, you know, three consecutive reports, look, traffic campaign and this purchase campaign identified the same three winners. Um, that buy-in. The key is you have to introduce friction. Um, so you can kind of filter out bouncing. And that's why traffic campaigns aren't helpful for um, filling the funnel because a lot of them do bounce. But if you introduce friction and use, say, content views plus any sort of event um, as your numerator in the uh, conversion rate formula, that actually does trend strongly with like overall performance in a like purchase campaign. Hmm. Um, but yeah, you graduate um, before I graduate, I'll take the friction back out. Jeez. The mad scientist. Yeah, fantastic. you can. How are you getting so many creative? Yeah, that's I me. Mean, some of it's legal. Um, a lot with the, you know, when you're testing themes, it's easy to test with images. So we extract those themes from image testing and that's usually a lot more reasonable to get volume from so those like the cheap tests help inform the expensive tests like the videos that take so much more time and yeah just another shot on goal and then a follow-up uh, i have yeah. on elizabeth's question there is just like are you are you typically like making creative internally on your agency relying on your your clients to give it is it a mixture of both it's it's both um you know we we, we have a creative team um you know david wasn't able to make it today um and then honestly like you know we we talk a lot about the Pareto principle and be honest with clients like hey most creatives are gonna fail so the more chances you take the sooner you're gonna find that next hero ad and we just try and use this cost effective testing process to make those shots on goal for the client happen more often so it's not like a wasted investment and spend, but no one can promise that, you know, any sort of testing process is going to guarantee like a hundred percent hit rate with like making future videos. But this does, I think, improve the, and increase the amount of like successful creative right. that you get. Right. 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 Okay. We probably have time for like one or two more questions. I'm just going to like randomly pick a couple now just to make sure we give love to everybody here. Let me go ahead. Yeah, I can answer one yeah, of these real quick. quick. It, you can share IDs in Advantage Plus campaigns. Um, if creative isn't getting a fair share of spend, uh, yeah, one ad per ad set. Uh, more. And then you're doing ABO. Are you? Case you know, you do ABO for those. Okay. Um, rough content does better or higher production UGC. Honestly, I'm 100 percent agnostic. I will tell you know whatever. whatever I'm being given, I will find a way to test and it varies so much by account um, and by like the demo you're reaching. So an emotional hook can do really well with the younger demo, but really kind of fall off with older demos where you start seeing educational hooks do a lot better. Omnichannel yeah. conversion measuring. Um, so someone say season for a Google example, someone sees or clicks on a Facebook ad. Um, ultimately comes back to the website through Google. That's what we're tracking with that custom conversion. And you can create that custom conversion for, you know, TikTok or any other um, channel. 
Great. You see, Kev, yeah. you ra- I know you're still fired up going to wrap. Oh, we're done. Time. Okay. I told you, you would have to control me. Yeah. <laughs> but we hit our time here. We hit our time. Everybody who you still have questions, I'll try to see if Kevin's available or some of these so we can throw it into the follow-up email so you got love but kevin i just wanted to say thank you i really really appreciate you holding it down i know this wasn't exactly what we both planned but i will say from my perspective you crushed it and audience thank you so much for attending yeah, let, let kevin know how it was throw love into thank the chat yeah no uh, let's give us Evan, yeah this was a ton of fun um i promise uh attention consistently have technical difficulties <laughs> Um, so yeah, love to do this again. Life happens. I thought we can, I, I feel we can talk for hours. Most definitely. Yeah. It's all good, Kev. Appreciate it. And everyone in the chat also does. Everybody enjoy the rest of your days. Sincerely from the bottom of my heart. You know, I love this creative strategy community. Hope to see you at the next one. Well, I'll talk soon. Okay.